we're going to talk about a little bit of history. So there's some very important things that have happened in the course of history. One of those inventions is sliced bread. That looks like some tasty bread. I know Mark's back there salivating. Bread is like his favorite food. But sliced bread. So before then, before sliced bread ever existed, they apparently ate their sandwiches like this. It was invented on July 7th of 1928 is when sliced bread was invented. That was a long time ago for us. None of us were alive in here. But before then, they ate their sandwiches like this. And it was invented in a place called Chillicothe, Missouri. Huh? Chillicothe is what it's called, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But before then, people would have to slice the bread themselves. And so they would have uneven slices. It would be you know, time-consuming. Or if you're like me and get frustrated with a dull knife, you would basically just rip it apart. And it would just look terrible. And so you just like smash the bread to make it look even, but it really wasn't. Why would I do that when I can just rip it apart? Hold, rip. Yes. But for people that actually bought it, it was a major time saver. And people were talking down about it, saying, you know, it's not going to be functional. It's not going to be good. People were saying it's a joke because the bread is going to go stale. But the guy figured out how to do it. And he moved to Chillicothe and got connected with a baker and like just made millions of dollars off of sliced bread. And so there's this saying, you know, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread because that was so important. Another big deal was the invention of air conditioning. This was invented around 1932. Could you imagine living in southeast Georgia in the middle of the summer before 1932? This guy sweats a lot. And that's in air conditioning. So, like... I don't like going outside if, if it's over like 85 degrees because I'm not just going to stand there and sweat. If I'm going to sweat, I have to be doing something. I can't just be standing there. So in 1932, God gave someone the idea to create indoor air conditioning, and it was marvelous. We love it. We have it in here. It would be hot and musty in here if we didn't. But throughout history, we've seen a lot of major historical events. Some were for the betterment of humanity, like sliced bread and air conditioning, and some were not. Some were actually to cause death and destruction. One of the worst things that a person had to go through during the Roman Empire was crucifixion. It was designed by people that were well-trained in torture, and they enjoyed it. They loved causing other people pain. And so the person was nailed to the cross, and then they hung there until they suffocated and died. And then if they didn't die quickly enough, they would break their legs to cause them to die faster. So, like, if you go back and read the story of Jesus being hung on the cross, they were going up to break his legs, and then the, the soldier stabbed him in the side, and it said that the blood and the water had already separated because he'd already been dead. But the other two, they broke their legs because they couldn't be alive during Passover. They had to get him down. So it was a terrible fate and one of the most painful things a person could experience. But God used something horrible and turned it into something great. And this became one of the most significant historical events, or if not the most significant historical event that has ever happened. Because of this particular crucifixion, now there were hundreds of other crucifixions. And if you go back and have time to read the article from the, um, that I wrote last week in the paper, I talked a little bit about this, how these Romans would take and they would crucify Christians. They would light them on fire and have parties around their burning bodies. So this is some of the stuff they had to deal with in the first century. And so there were others that were crucified, but there was only one that was this significant. And God used this one crucifixion to change the course of history. So what happened three days later was also one of the most significant things that have ever happened since creation began. This particular person that was crucified came back to life. And so tonight we're going to be looking at three different things. We're going to be looking at the resurrection and the significance of that, the relationship between old and new, and then we're going to be looking at the reign of Christ. So let's get started. We are still in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We will finish up with the chapter in the next few weeks. There's a lot of stuff in there, but it's all great. So the resurrection is going to be spoken about in verses 12 through 19. So if you have your Bible, open to 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to start in verse 12. It says, Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise. 
if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your, your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are all men to be pitied. So basically what these verses are saying is that if Christ had not been risen from the dead, then everything that we believe is a lie. And if everything that we believe is a lie, that means that we are blaspheming against God, and that also means that we are still lost in our sins, and we have no hope for salvation, no hope for eternal life or anything else. And so Paul is addressing this right here. And what's going on is, in the church, there are these two different camps. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. You've got one part of the church that believes that Christ is resurrected, and all Christians are going to be resurrected with him. Then you've got others in the church that believe that Christ was resurrected, but no one else is going to be. And this ties back into their philosophical beliefs that they've been believing their entire lives, that, you know, the physical body is evil. And so whenever they die, they're going to be separated from that. So no matter what they do in their physical body, it doesn't really matter because it's not sinning against God, as long as they're not doing it mentally or emotionally or spiritually. And so they, they've separated the physical from the spiritual. And Jesus, if you look at his ministry, especially when he talks about the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you know, it's been said this. But let me tell you this. So it's been said that, you know, if you murder someone, it's a sin. But now I'm telling you, if you hate him, it's the same as murdering them. So Jesus is combining the spiritual with the physical, because even the Jews had this idea that if they didn't sin physically, then they wouldn't be held accountable. And so Jesus is saying, no, it's the entire person. It's not just the physical. And so what Paul is saying here with the resurrection is that, no, it's not just physical. Your spirit is not the only thing that's going to get resurrected. Your body is going to be resurrected as well. And he's saying that if you don't believe this, then you're already kind of one strike away from being a Christian because we have to believe in the resurrection. And the fact is, Jesus said himself that we are going to be resurrected as well. And so if you don't believe that the resurrection of the church is going to happen, then you don't trust Christ, which means you don't believe him, which means you have no faith. And that's what Paul is getting at here in these verses, saying that if you don't believe in the resurrection of the church, then you don't believe Christ himself. And if Christ was not resurrected and the church is not going to be resurrected, then all of us are still lost in our sin and going to hell. And so for people to be Christians, they had to believe the resurrection of Christ was real, but some of them didn't want to believe it. And what they were doing is they were allowing their families that had not converted to Christianity. They were allowing their friends who had not converted to Christianity, maybe even their bosses or their teachers, the philosophers of the age, influence their beliefs. And so it was causing them this problem. And so I'm going to get you to discuss something with your neighbor for about 30 seconds. Has there ever been an instance where you listened to someone and did what they said instead of trusting Christ? So talk to your neighbor. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to, to figure that out. Has there ever been an instance where you listened to someone and did what they said instead of trusting Christ? All right, would anybody like to share? Did she? <laughs> so I've had instances like that in my life too. And the thing is, when you trust people, like especially your family or your friends, you're going to tend to listen to what they have to say. And it's going to be a lot more weighted than someone that you don't trust. And so the, the issue at hand is these people in Corinth, they did not trust Christ enough. They still trusted their family. They trusted their friends. And so when they were trying to formulate their understanding of the gospel and their understanding of Christ, they were allowing these foreign ideas to be intertwined in with Christianity. And it was causing them to have some sort of dualism to where Christ and, you know, Christ and Satan were equal and they were battling it out for your soul. And that's not the case. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that Satan is, any, is even close to being as powerful as God. God is still sovereign. He's in control. So they have family and friends they loved who had not trusted Christ. This caused problems for them. Paul used the verses tonight to encourage them to go all in. So that's the title of our sermon tonight is to go all in. Go all in in your faith. Believe it wholeheartedly what Scripture says because that is what's going to point us to having a closer relationship with God. Because these are his words written down by people who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. 
over the course of like 1,500 years, and they come across with the exact same message that points everything back to the Messiah, points everything to Christ. And so it's trustworthy. This isn't just a bunch of bedtime stories and fairy tales that people wrote to make you feel bad about yourselves and be scared of the boogeyman. These are people that lived very real lives and struggled very heavily with a lot of stuff. One of the most beautiful things about Scripture is the horror stories that are in there. Because if you go through like the book of Judges or look at the list of kings who failed God and did evil in his sight, it still points back to there being a redemption for humanity. So it shows that even in our worst possible times, God still loves us enough to where he's willing to redeem us. He's willing to to give us salvation if we repent and believe. And so even the difficult stuff that's in here still points to God being gracious and merciful and a savior. And that's exactly who Jesus was as well. But because the promises that Jesus made, his disciples and by extension us, if we are not resurrected, then he is a liar and he cannot be Messiah. So if we don't, if we're not resurrected, then Christ is a liar which means he can't be the Messiah, which means, again, we're still lost in our sins. And if if that's the case, and we continue to preach Christ even though he's a liar, then we're blaspheming against God. Does anyone know what blasphemy means? (laughs) Well, I'm going to tell you what it means right now. It means profane speech or action concerning God. So like one of the favorites in the South is saying GD. That is blasphemy against God. Saying Jesus Christ in the wrong way is blasphemy against God. Saying things that are untrue about God is blasphemy against God. You've got a lot of people in churches that are preaching blasphemous messages because they're more concerned with emotions than they are with, tr- with truth and doctrine. So they're blaspheming against God. So at least in my mind, this brings up an important question. The disciples who were exposed to Christ, who walked with him for three years, and then Paul who had this experience with Christ on the Damascus Road, all of them lost their life except for John. Every one of them was killed except for Judas. He killed himself. But every one of the disciples, except for John, lost their lives because of Christ. If the resurrection did not happen, why would they do it? If they were so convinced that this was a lie, or if they knew that this was a lie, why would they be willing to die for it? To me, that's evidence enough to trust the fact that Christ was resurrected. Because I'm not going to lose my life over a lie. These men literally saw Christ resurrected from the dead. And it says, if you remember back from last week, that he revealed himself to over 500 people at one time. All of these people saw that Christ had been resurrected. If you go back and look at historical accounts and other documents, there are guys that weren't even Christians that wrote during this time period, and they talked about the resurrection of Christ. There's enough evidence to show, hey, this actually happened. This is a historic event. And I'm sorry, if it never happened, these men would not have lost their lives for it. Because they did not end up rich. They did not end up famous. If we go by the world's standards based on what success is, these guys were an utter failure. Because if this was a money-making scheme, they lost their life for it. You've got thousands of other Christians that will never even know their names during the first century and since then that have lost their lives for this. Because they believed it and knew it to be true. And we can know that the same way as well. We know there are certain things that you must believe to be a Christian. We talked about those over the last few weeks. And the resurrection is most definitely one of those things. If you do not believe the resurrection happened, then your faith is not real. Scripture tells us that. The powerful thing about the resurrection is that it's the linchpin of our faith. Do you guys know what a linchpin is? Somebody tell me what a linchpin is. You got it, Sam? Yes, and if you pull that linchpin out, what happens? They would eventually fall apart. So it will make it unstable and it will fall apart. If you remove the resurrection from Christianity, everything else falls apart. The resurrection is the linchpin of our faith. It holds everything together. There's a lot of other important doctrines and a lot of other important things, and we'll get to another one in just a few minutes, but the resurrection is key to our understanding of Christ and salvation. If Christ is still dead in the grave, then so are we. If Christ never resurrected, then we won't either. And here's what's really cool about it. Christianity is very easy to disprove. If you want to disprove Christianity, go find the body of Christ. That's all you got to do. If you want to disprove Christianity, go find Jesus' body, And that's it. But guess what? People have been trying it for over 2,000 years and they haven't found them. 
And guess what? People are going to keep trying until the end of time and they're not going to find it because Christ is not there. Christ resurrected, which means we have a hope for eternal life because Christ has resurrected. It's awesome. So with that being said, Paul shifts gears into the next several verses and talks about this hope that we have in our Savior, this new life. So let's look at the old versus the new. Verses 20 through 23. He says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. So he goes from talking about the negatives of what happens if Christ wasn't resurrected and why these people weren't believing that. Say, hey, look, Jesus did resurrect. He was resurrected. So we can continue having this faith in Christ because we know as a matter of a fact that Christ has been resurrected. He says, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as an Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits after that, but those who are Christ's at his coming, and it continues on. So let's stop there. So Paul introduces a couple things. But let me ask you this first. If you had a choice between an old phone and a new phone, which one would you pick? Most of you would pick the new phone. I would pick the new phone also. New phones usually have better technology, better cameras, they've got availability for certain apps, better graphics, all these kind of things, because technology changes like every couple weeks. And so the new phone is always the shiny new thing, and we want to have that. Did you guys know that when cell phones first came out, you couldn't even text on them? Yeah, you couldn't take them out. You want me to tell you a horror story? Imagine if you had to call everyone instead of text them. Ah! As awkward as I am, I hate having awkward silence on a phone call. So I will text you in a heartbeat. But if if you could not text people on your phone, I don't think y'all would know how to communicate. (laughs) It didn't have apps or anything. Like the only game that was out at the time was like Snake. And that was well like 15 years after the first cell phone was created. The first one came in like this massive suitcase and it was like seven dollars a minute. When I had my cell phone, we had to pay for text messages. And you were the bomb if it was mounted in your car. Oh, I, that was before my time. <laughs> but I remember one month, Kayla and I, it was right after we started dating. And um, me and Kayla sent somewhere, well, like two or 3,000 text messages back and forth. And her phone bill was like several hundred dollars over what it should have been. Yeah, her mom almost disowned her. Look, I was in love, okay? And I still am. But now our texting is free, so I can text anybody. Our phone, our um. Oh, also, we had to wait until we had to wait till after nine o'clock to make phone calls. Oh yeah. Yeah. Also, if you were to start it was considered Yeah, there was roaming charges as well, so we had to make sure that we weren't in roaming. But like, we would wait till nine o'clock because Verizon had like unlimited minutes after nine o'clock because most people were asleep by then. So we would talk until like midnight, but it wasn't that impressive because it was after nine o'clock. Now I'm trying to be in the bed by nine o'clock. But, but yeah, things have changed drastically. I mean, now you've got free texting, you've got free calls, you pay for data more than anything else. And, I mean, you can check your email, your voicemail, you can check all of this stuff, and it's just all in your pocket. Now, let me ask you this. If you had a choice between an old pair of shoes and a new pair of shoes, which one would you choose? I had a pair of shoes when I was in middle school. I got mad and I kicked something and I ended up with free air conditioning. There was this big hole in the side of my shoe, and I had to wear it there for like a month. I would definitely pick the new shoes, or slightly broken in new shoes. All right? New things are usually always better. If you had a choice between a new car with no miles and a car with 300,000 miles, which one are you going to choose? When I was in college... I had a 1991 Honda Accord. It had 297,000 miles on it. And it died. I ended up giving it away to somebody, and they called me like, I don't want this piece of junk. I was like, it's yours now, man. But, yeah, no refunds. But it's, it's comforting to have a newer vehicle because you don't have to worry about it breaking down on you. The van that I currently drive has broken down on us like three times and has 160,000 miles on it. So I would definitely take a new car if I could, you know, pay it off without having to make payments. But typically we're always going to take the new stuff over the old stuff. Let me ask you this. How many of you love McDonald's? Okay. 
Did you know that their French fries are the closest representation to eternal life on earth that we will ever experience? I got you one better. Roll the video. You got to turn it up. What happened when you leave a McDonald's hamburger in the bag for over 20 years? And it was advertising a NASCAR race in 1996. So this dates the hamburger set to 24 years old now. French fries. Looks like they maybe could have fallen under your seat a month or so ago. They've never rotted or decayed. The hamburger itself. I'm scared about the burger. Oh, the meat. It's not even broken. It's completely intact. Look, this is not the only. This is not the only video. There are like 10 videos that I watched today that all of them say the same thing. Like one guy had an experiment where he took like five different hamburgers from different restaurants. And then he had a few of the McDonald's ones. And then he had like real fries and whatever McDonald's serves. And within like a few weeks, like every hamburger looked like it was sitting on top of the Alps. It was covered in mold. It was like oozing gunk out of it. It was really nasty. They had to throw them away. But the McDonald's French fries looked they had, like they had just come out of the fryer after like four months. No. I have found French fries from McDonald's in my car from college and they look brand new. I'm just saying. But... The McDonald's fries are the closest representation of eternal life. So we are going to get to heaven and we're never going to age. We're never going to die. We're never going to mold. We're never going to ooze weird things. We're going to be like McDonald's french fries, but not hard as a brick. But (laughs) McDonald's is pretty gross anyway. That's what you're putting in your body, by the way. With the resurrection of Christ, we're given the promise of eternal life if we repent and trust Christ as our Savior and our Lord. We will be in community with God and be on his mission for the rest of our lives. In verses 20 through 23, Paul is drawing a line between the old way and the new way. He mentions Adam as this as this original man. And we know that because of Adam, sin came into the world. And so each one of us, because we have an earthly father, has original sin on us. So that means that sin is passed down from the line of the father to the child and then here on and so forth. So all of us are sinners from the day that we're born. You might be cute when you're born but you're a dirty, rotten sinner, and you need a Savior. I tell my kid, Levi's like a perfect example of that. That kid is so cute, but if you saw a shirt tonight that says, I'm what, I'm what trouble looks like, this is what trouble looks like, and it is 100% accurate. But all of us have this sin nature in us. And so what's significant, another one of these linchpin things with Christianity is that Jesus did not have an earthly father. Jesus was born of a virgin, which means that he did not have the taint of original sin on himself. And so he was born perfect. And because we needed a perfect sacrifice for our salvation, Christ had to have been born of a virgin. And we see that with Jesus. And so he did not have original sin. So he was the second Adam, so to speak. Because the first Adam was in the garden. He had everything perfect. Everything was going the way it should. He had perfect community with God, and he ended up sinning. And one thing that tells me is it doesn't matter how great your environment is. If your heart is not where it needs to be, you're still going to struggle with sin. Jesus was born in a world that was sinful, a world that was sacrificing to false gods, a world where people were being persecuted for their faith. But his heart was where it needed to be. He was a son of God. He was perfect. He was tempted, but he never sinned. And so he was exactly who he needed to be to be able to be the savior of humanity. And he did just that. He was obedient to the father, even unto death. And so we see that Jesus was this perfect representation of who we are supposed to be. What humanity is supposed to be. We're supposed to be in perfect unity with God the Father. But because of Adam, he messed it up. And now all of us, until Christ comes back, all of us have to deal with sin. Even believers still struggle with sin because we're not perfect. We have the Holy Spirit within us, but we still have moments to where we struggle with sin and where we struggle with temptation. But Paul writes in verse 22 that in Adam all die. Through one man came death, being Adam. But Christ was different. Like I said, he was born of a virgin. Extremely important. Had Christ not been born of a virgin, Christianity is dead. Had Christ not lived a perfect life, Christianity is dead. Had Christ not been crucified as a sacrifice for our sins, a perfect sacrifice, Christianity was dead. 
If Christ had not been resurrected, Christianity is dead. So there's a lot of things that are extremely important to our faith that had to have happened for us to have a relationship with Christ and to have eternal life. And we see through historical accounts, not even just in the Bible, but outside of the Bible, that all of these things are true. And so we can believe that Christ, if sin travels down the line of the Father, the Messiah had to be perfect and sinless and therefore not have an earthly father. Because he's a son of God, he is sinless and therefore could be the atoning sacrifice. Paul goes on to say that not only is Christ resurrected, at some point in the future, everyone that believes in Christ is going to be resurrected as well. We're going to be given a new body. I don't know what that's going to look like. You can ask Brother Van on Sunday. But we're not going to have the same earthly body. I'm not even sure if we're going to look the same. Because whenever we look at the gospel accounts and when Jesus comes back after the resurrection, he can hide his identity. When they're on the road to Emmaus, they don't recognize who he is until after he breaks the bread with them and eats a meal with them. He's able to eat. He's also able to walk through walls, which is kind of cool. That'd be like a really interesting superpower. You could like run into a room and like your siblings in there, you could go through the wall really quick and just slap them and run out. That'd be pretty funny. And then he ascended into heaven, so he had the ability to fly. I mean, a flying guy that goes through walls and can hide his identity sounds like a superpower to me, or a superhero. But, so our, our resurrected bodies are going to be a little bit different than our physical bodies, but we are still going to have a somewhat physical body because that's what Christ had. And so it's, this idea of the resurrection is important because it's not just about Christ, but we go through two resurrections. The first one is when we're spiritually dead. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a dead person come back to life without some outside force. You know, somebody's laying on a table, they hit them with the shock pads or whatever that thing's called. It's like, clips! And, the, and they come back to life. So there has to be some kind of outside force that brings them back to life. With us, whenever we are not a Christian, we are walking around spiritually dead. And so God has to come in and bring us back to life or bring us to life. And so we have our first resurrection in the fact that we are spiritually dead and now we're spiritually alive. And then the second one is after death when the rapture happens for for us or if the rapture happens in our lifetime, then, you know, these things are going to happen. So the rapture will take us away. And it says the first in Christ or the dead in Christ will rise first. And there's this whole line of who's going to be there. So the, the dead in Christ will rise first. Those in the rapture are going to meet them in the air. And then it says that the ones that are alive during tribulation that are Christians are going to be taken next. And then in the thousand year reign, those that die are going to be resurrected, I think immediately, if I'm not mistaken. And so this whole line of resurrection happens and all of these things are dictated upon the resurrection of Christ. And so the resurrection is of the utmost importance in our faith. All of Christianity hangs on this promise. Everything we believe hangs on this promise of resurrection. If the resurrection never happened, our faith is pointless and we will never have eternal life. We would all be lost. But because of Christ and the truth of the resurrection, we have new life in Christ. The old man has passed away and the new man is alive. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. So then Paul goes from that to talking about the reign of Christ. So let's look at verses 24 and 28. And I want to encourage you to go back and read these verses because some of these are really interesting. And we don't have enough time to go into all of them. But really like dive into this chapter because it's a gold mine of information. So verse 24, so following up verse 23, but each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits after that, those who are Christ's at his coming, then comes to the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God, the father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that would be abolished is death for, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. So basically saying that everything in creation is going to be under the authority of Christ, except for God himself, God the Father. Well, Christ is God, God the Father. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. So what we see in verses 24 and 28 is what happens when the millennial reign is over. So a thousand years after New Jerusalem is established, Satan is finally locked away in hell forever. Death has been defeated. Sin is gone. There's no more temptation. There's no more sin. Every enemy of God is destroyed. Paul then writes that after this, Jesus puts everything and everyone except for God the Father under his authority. There's a really great verse, I think it's in 2 Corinthians, to where it talks about when Jesus comes back in all of his authority, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. People that don't 
know Christ. People that are atheists are going to bow and they're going to say Christ is Lord. People that have worshipped Jesus their entire lives are going to bow and say that Christ is Lord. If I'm not mistaken, even the animals, I mean, if they got a knee, they're going to bow. And so even the animals, like just imagine the scene from the Lion King where all of them are like bowing down to Simba, but it's actually Jesus. And they're going to proclaim Christ is Lord because everyone is going to be under his authority and under his power. And then we see this, uh, there's this transition of power, this beautiful thing to where the son takes everything that's under his authority and he gives it to the father. And so he subjects himself to the father and brings back this unity in the Trinity to where all of them are, are God. But Paul writes after this that Jesus puts everything under his authority. We see that authority has been given to Christ by God in Matthew 28, 18 and John 5, 26 and 27. In Matthew 28, Jesus tells us that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. That's in the Great Commission where he tells us to go out and make disciples. He tells us to go and make disciples in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he said, all authority has been given to me from the Father. And so that authority that Jesus has that has given us to go make disciples, we have the power and the authority to go and to preach the gospel and to see people come to know Christ and to tell them about the same resurrection that if you are a believer, you are going to experience one day. In the celebration that we're going to have in heaven, rejoicing over the fact that sin and death and evil has been defeated and temptation is no longer there. It's going to be a beautiful scene. Then in John 5, 27, we see that God gave Jesus the authority to judge because he's the son of man which the Son of Man is a title for Christ. And so everything is going to be judged by Jesus. You know, there's a saying that only God can judge me. I would rather my peers judge me rather than God, because God's going to be a lot more righteous than everyone else is. And so if we're not afraid of the judgment of God, either we are believers in Christ and we have been redeemed, or we're dumb. Because if you stand before God and you're not a Christian, you have not repented, and he goes through this entire list of everything that you've ever done, all these sins that you've committed, and there's no justification for that whatsoever, that is not going to go well. And you'll be separated from him for all eternity. So Jesus is the judge. And it says, at this point, Christ will subject himself to the authority of God the Father and will reign for eternity in his full glory in place in the Trinity. Well, we see... Or what we will see in the reign of Christ is that sin is abolished. There will be no more death. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more falling into temptation. We will spend eternity with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in perfect community. But the thing is, your eternity doesn't start when you die. Your eternity starts when you repent and trust in Christ. So you can have that community with God today. We still will struggle with sin and we'll still struggle with temptation now, but we can have the Holy Spirit within us, helping us, leading us, guiding us, directing us, comforting us, giving us that peace that only comes from above. If only we trust in Christ and the reign of Christ is never going to end. But if Christ has never been resurrected, none of this can happen. This is why it's important that we are all in in our faith. We can't be half hearted Christians. We've seen what that does to people. It confuses them. It makes them think that they can come to Jesus and still live in sin. Jesus said to come as you are, but then he said, go and sin no more. He didn't tell you to keep living in sin after you repent because it's not possible. If you have truly experienced Christ, your life is going to change because the Holy Spirit is not going to dwell within a dirty vessel. The Holy Spirit is not going to be within someone who is not repenting and trusting Christ. You might mess up. You might fall down. God is a God of second chances. I know you guys have heard that before. But if we are habitually living in sin and not repenting, then the Holy Spirit is not there. And so that's something you guys really need to deal with and really need to understand. Either we believe the truth or we don't. Either it completely changes our lives or it doesn't. It is not possible to be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, there is no eternal life. If you've not made the decision to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to do so. Come and find myself. Go talk to one of your small group leaders. But don't leave tonight if the Holy Spirit is really speaking to you and telling you to repent and trust in Him. Because the Bible says there's one unpardonable sin. And that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's the only sin that you cannot be forgiven for. Because eventually your time is going to run out and you're not going to have that opportunity. When we die, we don't get to repent. It's too late. We only get to do it in this life. And so if the Holy Spirit is dealing with you tonight and you really feel like you need to repent, come and find me. Talk to one of your small group leaders.